So where were we? We just um, uh, looked at uh, Vecchens and Var. Um, I want to take what looks like a little detour, um, but isn't, um, just to introduce some more bits and pieces um, of useful recurring structure and also some more kinds of equipment that we'll uh, encounter. Let me just comment that out so that I don't have holes all over the place. Um, so, uh, what
Uh, lots of these things uh, are, uh, uh, there's, there's a lot of applicative functions of bytes, I guess is what I'm trying to say. So we just built the components for the, the vector. Uh, so, and that really is one where pure means copy to every position and apply means applying corresponding positions. Uh, but there are um, uh, other ways to, to play it. Um, it's, um, it's very pleasing that in fact pure and apply are uh, some of the oldest functional programs we know when you specialize to this operation on types. That's to say, uh, abstracting over an environment and then you discover that pure is exactly the K combinator and the ply is exactly the S combinator. Um, so, uh, uh, so yeah, K drops the environment, S shares the environment. But if you think about it, if you think about vectors as somehow tabulating functions from positions, then that's all that's going on. Um, but uh, yes, um, some bits and pieces which are all exercises for you, and I will uh, skip over them cheerfully, are to show that uh, applicatives are closed under identity and uh, composition, uh, and also that every monoid induces an applicative structure. <coughs> um, what was I going to do? Yes. Um, uh, I should answer the question about um, about double curly braces. Uh, right. Um, so we've seen that single curly braces surround uh, implicit arguments, and those are arguments to be inferred by unification. That's to say, I mean, what, operationally, what happens is uh, that the machine sticks in unification variables to those things, type check and generates constraints. Hopefully, those constraints contain enough information to figure out to solve the, the unification variables. That's the, the mechanism for uh, one curly brace uh, parameters. The two curly brace parameters are called instance arguments and they are also by default implicit. However, the mechanism for inferring <coughs> is different. Specifically, uh, the, the machine tries to figure out how to fill in uh, one of these instance arguments by looking in the context for what is available. And if there is exactly one candidate for what could go there, then you get it. Um, so, uh, uh, this is a bit more like voodoo. Uh, and uh, this is the first time I've experimented in, uh, uh, in a big way with, uh, uh, with instance arguments. Sometimes they make me happy, sometimes I worry a lot. Um, so yeah, so when you say this, right, let, let's look at this sort of declaration. Uh, we, have, we had some up here. Um, when, I, so when I say, when I declare a record, first of all, let's go back one step. When I declare a record, uh, the name of the type constructor is in scope. But the names of the projection functions, so field names double as projection functions. However, they are not 
automatically in school just by declaring a record. So just from this declaration, I am not creating a top level thing called map. Instead, I'm simultaneously declaring a type and a module. The module is also called endofunctor. And inside the module, there's a thing called map. So endofunctor.map is the projection function that projects the map operator out of an endofunctor record. Um, now, uh, what the open does uh, is to unpack that module and bring those projection functions to the top level. So after this open, uh, there then is a function called map at the top level, which takes as its argument a record of some endofunctor type, and indeed it takes an implicit f as, as an argument before that, and extracts from it the map operation. The braces here explain how the endofunctor record is to be abstracted when map is brought to the top level. Uh, so that means instead of finding the record of, uh, of the endofunctor type as an explicit argument, go and find one in the context. So this is a way to do type classes on the cheap. And it's a bit wild west. Um, it was uh, it was one of those things that you know someone had a bright idea at an Agda implementers meeting, and it's in the system, uh, and maybe it could have done with a bit more thought before it was hacked in. But you know, it's uh, it's sometimes useful. So the object of the exercise is to say as infrequently as possible which particular structure we are using in the hope that it's just that obvious. Uh, but it isn't always. Um, so you end up playing games, uh, as you'll see. So, um, uh, so here's an example. Um, here I say that every traversable functor gives rise to an endofunctor with map being equal to traverse. Um, and, uh, and it's happy. I don't say which applicative. And you think about the process involved in doing that. It looks at the type of map. And thanks to the way that map is parametric in the element types, there's only one candidate for what the applicative functor could possibly be if it is to match the type of traverse. Namely, the identity functor. And although I haven't finished the exercise yet, I at least have made a top level thing that says the identity functor is applicative, and it's finding that one. So, you know, there we win. <laughs> um, uh, here, uh, in, uh, in implementing the um, uh, traversability of uh, vectors, uh, I, uh, I don't win. Uh, I have to tell it at least once uh, which applicative I'm using. Uh, and that, that's annoying, so I, I have to abstract it with double curly braces to match the fact that it's an instance argument uh, on the, the left hand side and invoke it uh, explicitly. But it's kind of nice, this implement. So this implementation of traversable for uh, vectors uh, is uh, the uh, uh, yeah, really uh, gives the idea. It looks just like writing map for lists, except that on the right hand side, everything's not, it's not done with your ordinary application. It's done with the application 
coming from an applicative functor. Uh, so uh, uh, there's the uh, usual sorts of exercises uh, to have fun with. Uh, so with vector traversal, depending on which applicative functor you plug in here, you're actually doing a whole bunch of different sorts of things. So if you plug in the identity functor, you're just doing math. If you plug in a constant, a constant functor delivering a monoid, then you're doing an accumulation across the vector. Um, and uh, yeah, there are all sorts of entertaining things that you might do. Uh, so, uh, yes, yeah, so one of my standard exercises, and I'll not give the answer away, is to implement a matrix transposition representing a matrix as a vector of vectors. And this is just, that just works. Think about what we were doing with length, length constraints earlier. Think about how you would write down something's a rectangular matrix using length constraints that way. Um, but with, uh, uh, with vectors, it's just a vector of vectors. Um, and uh, yeah, uh, the fact that vectors are both applicative and traversable is uh, extremely handy uh, in that respect. Um, okay. Um, let me kind of just. I'm, so there's much more exploration of this in the notes. Too much, because it was the thing I was just getting really fascinated by when I was writing, and I got distracted uh, and, and started having fun. Uh, sorry about that. Um, but uh, uh, yeah, so uh, crush is the special case of traverse that accumulates in a monoid. So you can see if f is traversable and y is a monoid, and we've got kind of some way to, if you think about it, sort of to quantify an element, then we can quantify that whole thing. Um, quantify, that's what to use there. But yeah, we can extract some monoidal value. Um, and where am I going? Um, uh, I want to just introduce the notion uh, of, a, of a normal functor and eventually I will point out, well, okay, uh, what am I trying to say? I'm trying to say that we've got this, so crush gives us a way to, uh, uh, to accumulate in some monoid by working our way across uh, a, a traversable structure. Uh, so, uh, suppose we choose the monoid, which is the natural numbers with respect to addition, and we uh, instantiate the function that we are uh, applying each element with the uh, constant function returning 1. Then we will be computing the number of element positions in some lump of data. Uh, so what I wanted to introduce was the concept of a normal functor, just a one way to describe a finitary container-like structure. Uh, which says, well, hang on a minute, what is there uh, in some container-like thing. There's a way of choosing the layout of the data and then uh, a, a layout will have some number of slots in it for the actual elements and uh, that's it. So a normal functor is given by a set of shapes or possible layouts and then for each shape you should be able to count 
the number of slots in it. So there's a size operation that maps shapes to numbers. And then the kind of uniform representation of data is to say, well, any value is just going to be represented, first of all, as a choice of a shape. And then secondly, depending on that shape, there's going to have to be a vector of elements that's the appropriate size. So then it's interesting to think, uh, well, which data structures correspond to normal functors. But it's nice actually to be able to talk about a whole bunch of different data structures not necessarily by reflecting the syntax of a data type system, but just to be parametric in components that describe uh, the structure of a layout. Um, so we can, we can put lots of different data structures, we can express them as, as normal functors. So here are kind of some canonical examples. Vectors themselves. That's the whole point. The whole of the shape information in a vector is its length. Uh, so, and the length is specified in the type. Uh, yeah, so what information does the supplier of a vector need to tell you to give you the shape? No extra information. Shapes are you, the shape of a vector is uniquely determined by the index. And that also is the size. So there's only one shape in a vector of length n, and the size of, for that shape is n. Meanwhile, for lists, then you see the shape information now lives in the structure rather than in the type. But the only shape information is exactly the length. So we get to play interesting games to show, for example, that the normal functors are closed under constant functors. Uh, so uh, constant functors, identity functors, uh, cool products, products. Uh, so that's a fun uh, game to play. Um, and uh, yeah, you notice that I'm throwing in um, the uh, uh, the obligation to implement addition for the natural numbers. <laughs> I wonder where that will come up. <laughs> um, but yeah, you get to sort of ask you, it's a, it's a rhetorical, uh, rhetorical process. Let's do one or two of them. Um, uh, we want to define the constant functor as a normal functor. The constant functor is packing up no elements of the parameter of the functor, but an A. So, if we want to represent that in terms of shapes and sizes, um, what should the shapes be? What non-element information do we need to pack up? Any suggestions? Don't be shy. <laughs> We're going to need an element of A, are we not? And once we've got an element of A, how many positions, you know, what size will the vector of elements be in a constant function? None at all. Um, meanwhile, how about the identity functor? How much choice of shape is there? None. None at all. So we better get the unit type. And then, how many places are there? Yeah, so we actually know. Here we get that the identity functor is exactly, I mean, on the nose, it is exactly the vectors of length one. Um, let's do pairs. Um, so we've got shapes and sizes for F's and G's. 
on the left hand side. What will the shape for a pair of an F and a G be? <laughs> yeah, the shape of a pair is a pair of shapes. And yeah, now I've got more brackets than I wanted. <laughs> Uh, uh, and uh, what about uh, the size of such a pair? Could multiply them. But you've got to think carefully about it. You've got to have uh, enough positions for the elements of the first component and enough positions for the elements of the second. So how many positions do you need? The clue is in the meta variable, two meta variables off from the cursor. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes. You need to add the sizes when you're taking the product of um, just, just out of interest, what would actually do today? Oh you would say I couldn't do it. Well, it would just say uh, I'm just going to pick any old random natural number. Yeah. Um, <laughs> no. Um, Agda does have a very snazzy syntax with braces uh, that let you write patterns um, uh, inside lambdas. However, I know for a fact that there are uh, errors in the implementation of this feature. So I never use it, except to show it. Because now, instead, I roll my own. So that operator, if I, if I put a question mark in, uh, and load the file, you see I'm being asked for a function from a pair. So what do I want to do? I want to uncurry a function from components. So I have a prefix operator, which I write like that. I wish the carrot was upside down. But um, uh, so now I've got a function from two components. So I can write uh, lambda fs gs arrow oh, question mark, and I've got the two components separately. So I use um, Use uh, uncurrying to split pairs apart. Excuse me, what did you press after you typed that question mark? Uh, control C, Control Space. That's why. That's why this is still in black and white. Good. It hasn't been reloaded yet. Um, and now I can say size uh, size f of the f shape plus that uh, size g. Uh, of the G shape. No. Um, but it, so suppose I hadn't um, been clever enough to predefine hat. Uh, could I use a local definition? Uh, what, how do you do that with width or something? Or, uh, yeah, so the annoying thing is, yeah, so you could use a local definition there because you're in the expression language by that stage. Uh, so, uh, one thing you could do is, is a let and then define the two projections. Uh, but yeah, it's a bit more, uh, more hokey. But it does work. Um, yeah, so it's interesting, yeah, I mean, I, 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 in defining uh, products correctly, um, there's, um, yeah, there's something interesting to realizing you need to choose addition on the sizes. Um, uh, there's, a, uh, there's a very interesting issue that arises. We took your suggestion and turn it around and ask, well, suppose we put multiplication instead of addition in this spot. Uh, what would we be defining? Positions. Um, Some sort of exponential. Um, 
in a in a pro in a, in a boring sense, it's like that's making positions. Um, but multiple. Yeah. So if you think about what it is for uh, two vectors, what do you get if you multiply? Depends what you mean by multiple. Well, sorry. Sorry. <laughs> sorry. If you, I, I'm asking. So what I'm saying. Suppose you replace this plus with times. Hmm. And you instantiate the two arguments with two vector types. Matrix. You matrix get you, you get enough to store a whole matrix. Yeah. Um, uh, and you can see that as either in row major or column major uh, format. Uh, and in fact, is that this structure is a kind of a tensor product which can degenerate to composition either way around. Um, because it's, it's essentially, uh, you know, F tensor G in this setting is the, uh, the subset of the composition uh, F composed G where all the internal G structures have the same shape. Because you're only picking one G shape instead of one for each G that's stored inside the F. So you guarantee that you can always distribute F and G past each other in those situations. And I've seen, I don't know if you've ever, the role of Bacchus used to tour with this talk about uh, where he would use the words F structures of G structures of all the same shape, but he would be using. Uh, a sort of simply typed framework to talk about the types of his data. So he couldn't actually give a formal notation to the structure that he was talking about. Uh, and if you have the ability to just form these tensor products, uh, then, uh, then you win. So yeah, I guess my uh, point here is just that uh, this sort of normal functor characterization of data structures allows you to do all the usual uh, sums and products and things like that but that's not all there is uh, they are uh, because uh, uh, shape and size are first class notions and can be manipulated directly you can, you can build more interesting things lots of fun exercises for you to actually build uh, to show that these things, which I, you know, this thing that we claim is a is a sum, really is a sum, uh, and uh, and stuff like that, um, and then there's a whole exciting distraction, which is to notice. Um, actually, I'm going to leave that comment out, and I'm going to. get this far um, and uh, uh, make a couple of observations. Uh, firstly, that simply because vectors are traversable, normal functors are traversable, uh, because they just have a tag and a vector. So you leave the tag alone and you traverse the vector. Um, but the other thing that's sort of slightly uh, more exciting. Well, we mentioned earlier that crushing with constant 1 measures size. If you instantiate the element type of a traversable functor with the unit type, then you're basically saying there are all the elements are boring, what you're just looking at is the shape. So every traversable functor gives rise to a normal functor, where the shape is just a thing with boring elements and the size is given by accumulating one for each element position. Uh, and there's been an awful lot of chat um, in, uh, uh, in the relevant bits of the functional programming community about what to traversal really means, what, traver what laws hold for uh, traversable, because um, when I wrote that paper, I was rather vague about it. Um, uh, to, that's an understatement. Uh, <laughs> uh, and what it boils down to 
is that uh, the, uh, the naturality properties uh, that Traverse ought to have ensure that a traversable uh, functor is naturally isomorphic to the normal functor that you get by doing this. And that's just all there is. A traversable functor is just some shape information and finitely many things that you can uh, work your way through. So, uh, so the point about this sort of notion of normal functor is that we get a sort of direct representation of this sort of generic notion of traversable. And there's a lot of exploration in the notes of sort of trying to establish that connection uh, between uh, normal and traversable. Ooh. Um, what else? There's lots of stuff in this file. Um, uh, let me not even uncomment this, because I want to do a bit of land calculus. Uh, but uh, I want to point out that given a normal functor, we can declare a recursive data type, which uses that normal functor to represent the shape of each node in the data. So here's how you do that. Maybe I will uncomment it so that we just get some. Um, uh, uh, color. Um, so what am I saying? Uh, that a tree parameterized by a given normal functor is given by nodes, which I'm writing in this funny bracketed style so I can typeset it nicely. Um, and what am I saying? Well, you just say, oh, I'm going to interpret n as an actual operation on sets and apply it to the very recursive structure that we are defining, and that's how you make uh, uh, a tree. You, you take a, a node structure specialized, uh, specified by the given node functor and you fill it up with subtrees. So that is our, kind of our first uh, uh, extremely generic recursive data type. Uh, you pick your normal functor appropriately, and this becomes whatever simple inductive, simple first order inductive data type you want. Sorry, could you I explain the angle bracket exclamation mark thing again? Right, that it sort of passed me by slightly. Right, so that is. In the definition oh, of sorry, context, okay, so that's, the, that's part of the definition. Uh, so I write angle brackets and exclamation marks. That is a phenomenon of LHS to tech. Uh, in that, what I really want to write are scope brackets. Hmm. Um, but uh, the way LHS to tech handles square brackets, uh, it does something kind of special. So it's hard to use them as parts of identifiers and get them typeset properly. Mm. So this is just sort of uh, brutal LHS tech hacking, and I'm sorry that it's in your face. Does, does it like LHS to tech? You can't, you can't write fancy Unicode stuff there and then have it turned into. Uh, you can. Or you could actually have it. Yes, I could use Scott brackets. brackets using fancy Unicode, but my fingers wouldn't cooperate. <laughs> um, uh, Your brain said no. Yeah. So instead, so what I, what my style is, source code is ASCII, and then the the nice <laughs> rendering, <laughs> the nice rendering. I'm so old fashioned. I would never use a line more than seventy eight columns. <laughs> it's fitting on my punch card, darling. <laughs>
when I declare a record, um, I, can, I say two things here. I say what the fields are, and they are given separately. Okay, these are the things that are actually stored in the record, the fields. I can, if I choose, give a compact constructor symbol for elements of that record type. And here I've given the infix slash so that I can write shape slash size when I'm building data and also when I'm pattern matching. So the, the holes in that construct have to match the number of fields in your record? They do. Could you, could you, uh, could you be a bit more elaborate in that, that constructor line to say what the type of the thing is? I believe not. Oh. They have to corres it corresponds to a, a function yeah. from the fields to the record. So, oh, I see. I yeah. see. oh. so in some sense, the type information is present. Yes, 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 yes. Yeah. Um, meanwhile, oh, here... So there, are, there are two underscores because there are two fields. Yes. yes. I can have fewer underscores. Yes. Uh, because once I... Oh, because, yeah. I'm allowed to write. And, and the first underscore is the first field, and the second one is the second. Just yeah. I mean, I'm allowed. Yes. Yeah. I'm allowed to compute. Uh, uh, I'm allowed to compute uh, functions. <laughs> okay. um, so you can have fewer underscores than there are arguments, um, and you just return a higher order thing, which you can then apply with the usual notation for application. Um, and just to be absolutely clear, set one can be set two or set three or set four, but it couldn't be set no. It could not be set naught because I'm storing sets inside this structure. Um, yeah. Now these thing, this thing here is not a field. And it's not governed by this field thing here. Here I'm just defining, I'm taking the opportunity to define a function that operates on normal functors. Now every normal functor has an interpretation. And it looks like I'm declaring that it just takes a set and gives a set, and it's kind of gratuitous having an underscore in the middle of the name. Except that once the record has been opened, the function acquires, like the projection functions, acquires a record as an argument. Uh, in this case, no, because I didn't write Funny curly braces here. So, uh, so this, so these things, shape and size, will act as projection functions from normal, with an explicit argument that's a normal functor. And similarly, this interpretation function will acquire an explicit argument of type normal, and that's the thing that will go where the underscore is. So that's to say, it is the thing of type normal which is being interpreted by moral Scott brackets, and they're being interpreted as functions from type to set. So once the module is opened, it makes some sort of sense. And that's why, when we get wherever it's got to, um, here, I'm saying interpret n as an operator on sets, and then apply that operator to tree n. And I'm using Scott brackets partly so that I don't have to put an extra set parentheses around this thing. But, uh, um, yeah. So this is just saying. Um, Use n to describe the node structures of data. Does the underscore in this function have any special possible meaning? Uh, it means the same thing, namely that that's the place where the stuff goes. So in particular, uh, if I do refine here, control C, control R, it will give me a place for the stuff inside the... Um, so it's a mix fix unary. Yeah, but you define fu funny kinds of brackets. And if I do another define, I'll get a pair. And then at that point, the fact that I haven't yet defined this normal functor will mean that we can't get it further. <laughs> um, but I am, of course,
going to define it as k1 plus a i. Um, except that I haven't defined plus n yet. Uh, but that's the same. So a natural number is either given by uh, some leaf or it's given by one substructure. Is it zero or is it set? Mm. So when I if it, so when I when I declare a record in actor, I, I can't help but declare a module, right? Yeah. So but actor what, 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 uh, actor modules aren't like I don't know, NL modules or something. I mean uh, I mean is there any data like no, but they're very definitely not like a module. Right. They are just, just namespace. managed namespaces. Oh, I see. Okay. That's all they are. Right. Managed namespaces and parameterization. Right. Shared. But yeah, nothing. There's nothing fancy uh, going on there. Uh, okay. Um, so this is all uh, useful stuff. Um, I was going to talk about theorem proving at some stage, but maybe that will happen uh, later. Uh, I was going to prove that, um, uh, that if your applicative functor obeys uh, the uh, applicative laws, then the functor it induces obeys the functor laws, which can kind of hope. Uh, uh, in order to do that, I was going to have to go on an extended rant about equality, and other than saying that. Uh, bringing up the subject of equality is the single best way to start a fight in a room full of tech theorists. <laughs> <laughs> I will not. Uh, uh, Do you mean that by definition or is that a proposition? Well, exactly. <laughs> 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 um, uh, yeah, what, what on earth is going on with the, the equality is, uh, is a source of considerable uh, consternation. So, uh, uh, so let me live to fight another day on that score. Uh, uh, pull up the source code for these notes. Uh, just do a little bit of land calculus. I'm sorry, this is just going to be, this is going to be less active than one might have liked. Um, but uh, I want to show you uh, how to model simply like land curves in a reasonably precise way. In fact, if I'm going to talk, I mean, if I'm going to speak to the notes, then I'm, I guess I'll do the boring thing and just find it here because it'll look nicer. Generally, uh, and the terribly typeset 
constructor is supposed to be a backward comma. Um, and you can see that it's, crucially, it's left associative because it grows at the right hand end. And then the representation of variables is as typed to Brown indices. Uh, so here, so how do you do scope safe, type safe, and uh, the Brown indices? Well, basically, you are just witnessing membership of the context. You just define exactly uh, list membership. So here I'm saying, you know, when is some type in a list of types? I could define this polymorphically over what the numbers are, um, but some, for some reason I didn't. Uh, so I'd say, well, uh, de Brown index 0 is the thing that witnesses that tau is in gamma comma tau. And the de Brown index successor says, well, if you have a witness that tau is in gamma, then you should surely know that tau is in gamma extended by one thing. Um, so uh, the nice thing about this is that we not only know how far down the context is, we know it has the type that we want. And then we have a line break in an unfortunate place. Um, we define the type safe syntax um, just by writing down syntax directed typing rules uh, as, uh, uh, as a data type. Uh, so here you'll notice, so I'm making that infix current style, you'll notice I've got a context left of the colon, but the uh, type right of the colon. And that's because I need to be able to instantiate the type, but I'm always happy for these term constructions to have a return type uniform in the context. So here I say, well, a variable is just a witness to occurrence in the context. You make a term from a context pointer, in effect. For lambda, sorry about the page break, you say, well, if I have a term of type tau in gamma extended by sigma, then that gives me a term of type sigma arrow tau in gamma. And you'll notice here, I'm using in a recursive position something other than gamma but always in the return type, it's uniform. And that means that that context is not a parameter. It's simply, you know, it is an index which is not being specialized um, in the return type. So uh, that's a key distinction. And then for application, you know, hooray, you know, we just write down the application one. Um, uh, so that's, um, uh, that's a bucket of fun. We would just, you just write it down on the nose, what the things that make sense. Um, and, uh, uh, yeah, so it's, it's absolutely, it's, it's one of the marvelous things about working in a dependently typed meta-language is that uh, you can uh, nail down simply typed object languages really very easily. Um, but, I mean, it's very easy to stray off the, the path that leads to, to this kind of formulation, right? So it's a little bit of a for us. Yeah, I mean, you could do, I mean, so one, there are all sorts of things you can do that, that, that will give you a miserable time. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> uh, I mean, part of the problem, so, uh, uh, so early attempts uh, to, um, uh, to do this sort of thing uh, involved uh, indexing the contexts by their length 
and then uh, just using bounded numbers as the Brown indices, and then in the variable rule, you actually have to like put a little function here to look up the type that's indicated by the bounded number. And that looks like it might be quite a good definition until um, you try and define substitution. And then you're in a world of pain. Um, so, uh, yeah, uh, one of the things that's sort of sadly missing here, and it's difficult to have time to do that sort of thing, uh, is uh, to, uh, to study apocryphal definitions of things. You know, what, what else we might have tried, another way of doing it and seeing what trouble we get into when we do it and why, which things are bad news and which things are, are okay. Because I, I might say that, you know, you're, a world of pain is still awaiting you, right? Because, um, because you've forced yourself to, to make the context uh, part of the syntax of terms, so you're going to have to be critical <coughs> from now on. Yes. Right? And that is a world of pain. I'm going to have to be critical from now on, that's yeah. true. Yeah. Uh, and you have to uh, say, you know, stem my context in any way. And yep. Yeah, uh, and we'll get there. So uh, uh, we'll, we'll enter that world of pain and, uh, uh, and try not to let it get the better of us too badly, but we won't entirely succeed. <laughs> um, okay, so this is the, the boring um, semantics, uh, but you know it's nice that it fits into this sort of screen flow. So this is just writing an interpreter for closed values. Uh, but it's a good introduction to how this sort of thing works. And basically, you just say what things mean, and all the pieces fit together, and it's fabulous. I mean, just stare at it. Isn't it lovely? <laughs> so, um, uh, you know, uh, you pick some interpretation for your base type, you interpret function types as functions, um, you interpret in contexts as environments built as tuples of things that are the right type. Um, uh, you can interpret uh, context membership as the ability to project a value of the type you want from an environment. And then when you interpret the terms, everything just fits together perfectly. And, uh, uh, and there's no junk, no worrying about, oh my goodness, there might be a dynamic type error because our term representation had uh, rubbish in it. And uh, we're all kind of delighted. Um, so yeah, just imagine what it was like to write that program in 1999. <laughs> <laughs> and think, you know, goodness me, all of the stuff that's not happening here. <laughs> um, it's uh, uh, still a, a, a thing of, of great pleasure. Um, of course, if we actually want to do more symbolic kinds of evaluation, uh, then we are uh, uh, entering, uh, entering the nightmare. Um, and indeed, even if we want to define substitution... Um, uh, I'm sorry, it's, it's not obvious at all why are we entering the nightmare. We are well, we about to find out. <laughs> Right. So here we have not yet entered the nightmare because we concern we are concerned only with closed things. So this is defining what it is to be a closed value of a given type, and environments pack up only closed values. Um, and then um, we really interpret uh, object language lambda as agda lambda. And Agda is happy to normalize under lambda for us, so that's nice. <laughs> so, but if we wanted to explain how to do it symbolically and get back uh, an actual simply type lambda term resulting from normalizing something, we're in a whole different business. Um, there are lots of ways to play it. But even defining substitution, oh, I see I have screwed up my formatting and not got appropriate Greek happening here. Um, even defining uh, substitution
institution uh, is, is a bit of an undertaking. Uh, so let me just mention how to do it, uh, one way of doing it, um, which isn't the way I used to do it. <laughs> uh, yeah. So, um, so first of all, I define what it is to be a simultaneous renaming or a simultaneous substitution from gamma to delta. And a simultaneous renaming is a type-safe mapping of variables from one context to the other. Simultaneous renaming is a mapping of the variables from one context to terms over the other, which respects type. Now, the trouble that you get when you try and take a simultaneous renaming or a simultaneous substitution and actually apply it to a term is that when you go under a binder, you're not in the same context anymore. So you've got to figure out what to do. In fact, that's why it's good to use simultaneous renamings and simultaneous substitutions because at least you're being asked the question what do I do with this new thing that didn't exist before? And it has a sensible answer. Um, so yeah, so what we need to work with are actually substitutions that know how to go under binders. So that's what I'm now going to define with an extremely awkwardly positioned page break. It's driving me nuts. Um, but um, uh, here I introduce uh, the operator which is known to its friends as fish. Um, fish takes uh, a backward list and a forward list and it combines them to make a backward list. That's why it's, uh, it's backward, forward, Backward. <laughs> and that looks like a fish. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, but yeah, so it's like when you've got an abacus, it's the leftward slap on one rail of an abacus that moves all, all, the, all the beads uh, to, to the left, but doesn't reorder. So then, um, uh, a, a shiftable substitution, or a substitution, um, uh, is uh, a simultaneous substitution that allows you to fish on any context extension. Um, and then you can deploy a, a substitution uh, really uh, straightforwardly because uh, when you go under a binder uh, that just tells you that there's a particular shape of context extension that you're expecting so you can just specialize your shiftable substitution to those which are being shifted by at least one cons uh, so it's crucial to use the fish operator rather than concatenation here because this type checks only because we're moving our finger one step between the backward list and the forward list. Um, that's, why this, uh, that's why this type checks. Um, but uh, it, uh, it comes out quite neatly. Of course, all I've done is uh, move the trouble somewhere else. <laughs> because then you have to show that the substitutions you want are actually shiftable. <laughs> and how the hell do you do that? Um, so uh, it's easy to show that renamings are shiftable. 
Uh, weakening a renaming just means taking zero to zero and doing whatever you did before. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and, uh, uh, and then shifting, which is activating, weakening. And then once you know how to rename, you know how to weaken a substitution, and then you can iterate that to get shiftable substitutions. Uh, so that's the machinery uh, for substitution. And then I'm going to do one last thing before I stop, just for Andy, um, which is to load this file. Um, and as you can see, it, it type checks the little gold. And I'll observe that uh, here, I, I write something which is supposed to be a first order, you can tell by its type, it's a first order term in De Brown syntax. But I've got a smart constructor called lambda, spelled out longhand, and I'm feeding an act function with an actual lambda. And just using the variable like where I want it. And it's got like no names and things. <laughs> um, and if I, for the first time today, run a program <laughs> evaluating my test, it is the horrid Debrahim representation. And uh, yeah, the um, uh, there's a whole massive digression in the notes, um, which actually leaves the clever bit as an exercise uh, uh, in order to get this working. But uh, yeah, I thought I've got to get this this working for Andy. Uh, got the proof out uh, last night. <laughs> so, <laughs> Uh, there's a failed attempt at this technology up here in the notes. Where's it got to? Um, uh, yes, yeah, so the proof's in, in the source code, of course. Um, uh, yes, uh, here's here's an attempt. If I if I comment this back in. Then I get a nasty yellow X. I mean, you're just trying to do the identity function and I can't figure out what's going on. Yeah. Um, uh, and yeah, but the type of lambda prime is almost intelligible. It says if you're trying to make one of these, then you have to make one of these, and I will give you a polymorphic value which will agree to be a term in, of the right type in any suitably extended context if only it can infer what the extension is and then compute from that how to shift. The trouble is that, uh, yeah, so that should be possible in principle just by comparing the context where, we're, where, where we come from with the context where we're at now in order to solve for this variable. But unfortunately, that amounts to saying that we've got two lists, one longer than the other, but they agree at the far end, solve for the near end. And that's not going to happen with ordinary constructor-based first-order unification, and that's why it, uh, it can't um, figure this out. Can't solve, it can't figure out what to put here. However, Uh, just, just remind us again what yellow means. Um... Uh, so yellow means sus pish us. Right. Okay. Um, what red means clearly wrong. Yeah, well, yeah, well it's brown. Brown. Yeah, it means uh, <laughs> clearly wrong. Um, brown is sort of shit. <laughs> yes. uh, no, the, those are the background colours are the only parts of my colour schemes which I which they preserved. Uh, 
as obviously universally motivated rather than based on, well, or humanly motivated as opposed to based on obscure jokes about British politics. Uh, uh, um, yeah, I mean, the, the red blue distinction and all of that sort of stuff. <laughs> the um, uh, uh, green uh, for defined things, I used to colour uh, meta variables orange. Uh, so the, the green orange distinction is, is an Irish uh, it's an Irish politics joke. <laughs> uh, uh, orange is the colour of problems. Yeah. Uh, and unification is a gradual process of turning orange things green. <laughs> 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 So yeah, so the trick, if you want, if you want to solve that, if you want to get the unification algorithm to solve that problem, you have to serve it up in reverse order. And then prove that solving the reverse problem and reversing the answer is the same as solving the original problem. And that was just a real messy bit of theory proving, which I finally got out at midnight last night. <laughs> I wasn't very happy with the proof. Uh, which is why I ended up finding a nice one to <laughs> make. <laughs> um, okay. Um, we're, uh, we're overdue for a break. But I'll stop there for the